Bible study, and um, uh, we'll, at that Bible study, we'll discuss how far we want to go until we take the break for Christmas. You know, um, once we get closer to the holiday and there's things going on, we'll, 
will stop and come back in January. Um, the this Saturday is the Savers thing, so if you want to be involved, what time, Mark, on Saturday? 10 a.m. is the delivery. Okay, so be at the church at 9.30? 9, 9.30. Yeah. All right, and then, of course, uh, the 24th, which would be the day before Christmas at noon, we're going to have a light lunch and then a Christmas uh, service, and uh, we're going to have uh, our grandkids here, and, you know, so I don't know how that's going to work out. <laughs> We'll see how that works. No guarantee. You'll get cute. That's pretty much it. All right, let's take our hymnals or look up on the board there. Do you want to do the verses? Or wow. Oh, yeah. All right, let's say these verses together. Ephesians 1 3. And blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before day that we should walk in them. Now unto him that is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask for things, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. All right. Now we can turn to our first hymn, and we'll stand and sing that. Great him, uh, more about Jesus. chapter 3.
For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he had made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in all the other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof by him was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him, whereof I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your gift, your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he might grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, and depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all full, the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. May God bless us as we look at this passage of Scripture. It's quite a big undertaking, and I, as a matter of fact, am not going to finish. It's in a two-part um, message, but the second part is uh, stands on its own, so um, you know, it's not going to disrupt the message at all, um, but because of time, we have to kind of, well, as we go to prayer this morning, I see my prayer sheet is manual again, so I'll go from memory. I'll continue to pray for uh, Matt and Mary. She goes to see the doctor about her uh, lung infection and um, uh, pray for her because she has lost so much weight. Um, it's not healthy. Pray for Matt as well as he's attempting to continue to lose weight and uh, um, just uh, Matt and Mary's well being, I guess, Keith and Elaine, of course. And uh, I pray for Gerard's mother and Ben. Uh, both um, have contracted. Um, the uh, popular thing, COVID. COVID. Okay. Even so, though they were vaccinated. And they were vaccinated, etc. But uh, Ben is doing really well and is okay. Both had infusions and seemed to be on the meds. So um, it was one of those uh, feelings. Yeah, I'll pray for our nephew. Um, he's in the hospital. He's 37 years old. He's got COVID. And um, he's on he's a respirator. Yeah, he's oh, just friendly. Friendly. Is he on respirator or just oxygen? No, it's just oxygen. Okay, good. Just oxygen, yeah. What's his name, Billy? Greg. He's in uh, actually Ellen, Ellen Park. Chicago. Chicago area, yeah, so good. Say hi to Miriam. Church family. Mm -hmm. Hi, Miriam. Amen. <laughs> she listens every Sunday and she likes to hear your voices. Oh, Miriam was a lady in our church for. 30 years, 20 years, and she's back in Brazil, so, um, so she misses us, we miss her, and the marks she used to make, cleaning the sink in the kitchen, yes? Right. <laughs> um, my question is about Rose, she had her knee replaced, and she's uh, trying to recover, it's not easy, she's like 80 something. What's her name, Rose? Mm -hmm. Rose Pedrasso. Hey, for, uh, 
Pastor and Louise, and especially for Louise, she's in a lot of pain right now, and uh, all sorts of difficulties. And pray for Chester, broke his foot again. Oh, yeah. He's supposed to wear that boot, but it's hard to play the piano and other things, and I guess. We may have a prayer request. Sir? My mother uh, lives at Cadence Park and um, pray that she comes to a saving grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What's her name? Iris. If you want me to go visit her, I will. Pass it on to your mother that you. You know, you know somebody, and if she needs somebody, I'll go up and say, King's okay. Park's just uh, oh, a stone's throw, right? Park. Well, that's yeah. another stone throw away. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, these are visitors. They're from uh, Florida. Hollywood. Yeah, from Hollywood, Florida. We bring you sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to give you some snow later. <laughs> <laughs> We're not known for snow here, so um, we do get snow, but it's not as bad as upstate, so you, you should be able to escape. Now, going into the Carolinas, that's another story. You, know, you never know. So. Let's pray to God, Father. We're thankful for this opportunity to get together. Thankful, Father, that you have provided for us your word that we can trust, that we can uh, study and apply in our lives. And that we're thankful, Father, for the Holy Spirit that resides in each one of us. And we pray, Father, for our loved ones, our grandchildren, our kids that are uh, living in different parts of the country now and we pray for them and we uh, pray for our church family and for Matt and Mary and for Keith and Elaine and for Pastor Art and his wife and uh, we pray for Gerard and uh, this uh, Rose father as she recovers from knee surgery and for Al's sister uh, Barbara and we pray for Paul and wisdom for the family as they try to um, make sure that he's cared for and for Carl as well, that the sore would heal. We pray for uh, um, Iris, Father, and that uh, she would come to Christ, that you would just uh, work all these things out according to your will. And we pray, Father, for uh, uh, Ben and his mother, his grandmother, and George's mother, Father, as they recover from COVID. And uh, we just pray, Father, for Israel. We pray for our our government, our soldiers, and uh, whatever comes this year, Father, that uh, you would uh, uh, allow us to be a, a part of this community and that, that we might be able to reach out with the gospel. We're thankful, Father, for all the promises you've given us, and uh, we just give you the praise for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Been 10 years since we came to your shores we've been doing this for 10 years and I hope it never becomes just something that we do as Baptists because uh, God gave us this opportunity to celebrate this one truth that unites us that not only did Jesus die on a cross for our sins but the third day he rose again and uh, that's the promise that we have so as we think about his um, 
body that was beyond recognition. Um, and think about it in a personal way that he did that for you. And he suffered it for us. And uh, his blood, his shed blood, appeased God's wrath and gave us forgiveness. It's a wonderful thing to think about and uh, to dwell on that Jesus loved us so much. And then, of course, he gave uh, Paul instruction, and we're going to go through this passage now. But I'm going to ask Keith to pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we just thank you now for this time. We thank you for dying on a cross for each one of us. Guide us now this day and keep us close to you. In his name we pray, amen. Paul said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now would you pray over the grape juice, please? Our gracious Father in heaven, we do thank you for the blessings that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we thank you especially this morning, Lord, as we come before you at the communion table. We thank you that you went to that cross, knowing full well the suffering that Christ was about to endure. And, uh, we just thank you for the blood that was shed for each one of us for the remission of sins. Lord, we pray that you would bless the elements we're about to receive, Lord, in each one that's here. Help us, Lord, to be worthy of that great sacrifice that you made for each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Well, let's you can remain seated. We'll sing one more hymn together. When I survey the wonders cross. Mm -hmm.
Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this time. We pray, Father, that you would just uh, lead, direct our steps as we investigate this passage of Scripture, finding application and truth that will aid us in our relationship with you, Father. We uh, pray, Father, for those that couldn't be with us today for various reasons, Lord, that you would be with them as well. And we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have uh, Paul uh, beginning the next, the next narrative. He's, he uses this phrase for this cause, which is really kind of uh, reminding him of all that he has already said. Uh, he, he says that he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And uh, he had been in prison. He was in prison uh, for five years. Uh, some of that time was in Rome. Um, he was in Jerusalem, and he was uh, accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. And that's found in Acts chapter 21, if you're interested. I think the guy's name was Trophimus, and he was a Gentile. And uh, uh, I don't think it was true, but I think that... Uh, uh, you read the passage, you'll find it's quite interesting to read. And uh, they were going to kill him, but uh, come to find out he was a Roman citizen, and they couldn't do that. So, um, uh, matter of fact, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, i got to research how Paul became a Roman citizen. It was from Troas, and he was born there, even though he was Jewish. You know, um, that's, uh, that's, that's where I was going to start in my investigation. So, sorry about that. Catch you next week on that, but uh, to give you a definitive answer, he was Rome. He was Roman, obviously, because uh, he was given that special uh, sanction. So he was sent to Caesarea, and he was there for two years. But if and uh, some of the writers that I, I read, um, I guess you can call them commentaries or whatever, um, they basically uh, basically agreed that if he did not appeal to Caesar, he would have been let go because he was not guilty of whatever they charged him for. So here we find Paul in prison. And uh, uh, most people, when they're captured and imprisoned or held without, uh, um, against their will, uh, they may moan the fact, but we find that Paul does not. He, he uses that as a, a way of encouraging the Gentiles. Um, you have to remember that in the first century church, the Jewish folks and the Gentiles, which is the word ethnos in Greek, which Counter means anybody but a Jew was a Gentile. So not just Greeks, but anybody else were that persuasion. So there's always been kind of a barrier. And uh, in the Old Testament, of course, if somebody wanted to know about the true God, they had to go to Israel because they were the ones that were the communicators of Yahweh at the time. And so in the first century, when the church uh, when they embraced Christ and the church was started in the book of Acts, it was mostly Jewish people, but of course, Gentiles were responding. And if you remember the stories in Acts, they went down and uh, um, authenticated that they were truly saved and the, the church was born. Now we're in Ephesus, and uh, it's a mixture of um, Gentiles and Jews. And there, there's still a little bit of a problem, I imagine, because of the Judaizers. Remember I told you that? Judaizers. The uh, Gnostics and the false prophets all had their opportunities to try to stir the pot. But Paul here uh, gives his focus, reveals the dispensation, which just means administration or uh, stewardship of this time, where God reveals a mystery that the Gentiles are also included into the body of Christ. And that's kind of the theme. So what we find is, Paul the prisoner, Paul the preacher, Paul the pioneer, and Paul the prayer, 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 er, I don't know how to say that, and then Paul the praiser, that's, that's chapter three, and uh, I could have broken it down into five or six different messages, but that's not my intent today, because I want to give you a consistent flow of Paul's passion for these folks. He, he wanted them to be uh, included, felt like they were a part of the body of Christ. Our church, we have folks from all different walks of life, and most churches do. And uh, uh, whether rich or poor or different ethnicities or whatever, uh, we're made up of all different folks. And uh, that's the norm for the church. A lot of times there can be difficulties because of that. 
I find mostly in our era, in our country, it's more with money and no money. It has really, that's kind of, in, in larger churches, seems to be a problem. But uh, Paul's passion was that they would recognize that they were um, given this wonderful position of being a part of the body of Christ because of what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished. And so that's the route I'm going to take. I'm going to focus really on Paul's prayer that it happens mid, mid part of the passage, but I didn't want to skip anything because I'm not going to come back to this. But uh, you'll see that he, he explains to the readers about uh, the revelation that he had made known unto the God had made known unto him uh, this mystery that uh, he had wrote for a few words uh, whereby we you read, you may understand my knowledge of this mystery of Christ and of the, in other ages, uh, God did make this known to man, but by the apostles and prophets, the Holy Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fell heirs. So all of five, one through six really kind of centers on this idea that the Gentiles were in. Now, this is a new knowledge. Obviously, these Gentiles were believers in the Ephesus church and uh, the Galatian church and all the other churches that were surrounding this uh, this letter that was probably passed along to other churches. But he says in verse 7 that, whereof, or I became uh, a minister, a servant, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So Paul makes this transition. Even though he's imprisoned, uh, he's, uh, he has the pastor's heart for these people, this ethnos these Gentiles, these believers now that were not a part of uh, Israel, but were, were uh, joined in. And uh, I don't really can't grasp the significance of that because, you know, we're so far gone from that. But um, it is something to consider as we understand how God, uh, even in the Old Testament prophecy, talked about this union of all men you know, not just the Israelites. And so uh, this uh, occasion that we are looking at now is quite significant. Um, and this is all introduction, so just hang with me as I try to fill this in for you in the time that we have. He says, uh, uh, and it's not a false humility. You know, um, sometimes we want to be humble and uh, we, we try to manufacture it. Uh, it should come from the heart. But he says, um, you know, this, this gift that God gave me, he, he was the least, um, who I am less, in verse 8, than the least of all the saints that this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. If you do diligent study and read as you watch Paul after the road of Damascus, you'll find that he was never really trusted, you know, because he was, he was a bad guy. And he was after the church. And, uh, you know, it was a frustrating thing. Plus, he was a Pharisee. And uh, all that baggage, education, etc. And uh, I believe that God wonderfully chose him to be the one to go after the Gentiles. And so, it was a, Paul looked at it as a privilege, as a gift. And uh, um, this unsearchable riches of Christ that he shares as he preaches. I should preach among the Gentiles this unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Uh, you might just read those words but if you were to take the time to measure the depth of the theology that's floating in this in the sentence uh, each phrase would uh, uh, fill some pages of notes as you think about what he was saying that uh, God at this time was revealing uh, this uh, significant union of these two great people. Uh, someone once asked me, uh, how did this all start? And I, I remember reading in the, in the Old Testament where at one time all men were under the same language. And they, they thought they were quite something. So they built this tower called Babel. And you probably know the story now. And uh, they were all together thinking they were going to do something great, not necessarily reflecting God, but them. And God decided to uh, make them different. 
languages. So um, we sometimes wonder why uh, you know the world is split the way it is, but that was the origin of that, where Italians and Russians and Germans and French and all these languages uh, all of a sudden came. So you went with someone you could understand, and that's kind of how God separated mankind back then. But what we what I'm building for here in this uh, section, uh, we have uh, uh, Paul revealing his uh, passion. And verse 10, it says, and to intend that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. He's basically saying God has decided now because of Israel's rejection of the Messiah that the church would be the, the uh, recipients of uh, God's wisdom and God's revelation. And in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. So that um, uh, phrase, boldness and access, is actually the stepping stone to where we're going to head. Because of all that Paul reveals, it pushes him to the uh, his knees. He he. It almost seems like in the beginning he starts out that way and then he has a digress. You know what a digress is? You know, what was that? Yeah, he, uh, he all of a sudden thinks, well, wait a second, let me fill the blanks in and then I'll go back to this. Because in 13 he says, wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation. So there's a lot of uh, things that had to be said to get them to the point where he's going to share his uh, passion with them. Uh, they probably were concerned about Paul because he was in prison. And maybe they were thinking he was unjustly in prison, which was true. But he says, I desire that you faint not, uh, don't lose heart, don't give up uh, because of my tribulation for you, because it's your glory. Uh, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father. And here's where we begin, because I'd like to share at least three things with you this morning. Uh, Paul's passion in his prayer. And uh, uh, there's no class in seminary or Bible college where they teach you to have passion. You know, some of us that come out of the pastor mills are robots a lot of times. We have been trained into doing certain things. And uh, uh, after a pastor has been with a congregation for a while, the natural transition becomes the pastor becomes in love with the people it's the normal thing that uh, you are concerned about them and in our small church you know i know everything i know where you live and i know who you, what your names are and your kids as much as you let me know and so i can pray on a regular basis about that and this is what paul is trying to share just because i'm not there and i'm in prison don't give up. I'm here for you. And he says, because of Christ, we have this access. And uh, what, what he was saying was that not just he, but they as well have this access to God's throne. And if you were to be given the opportunity of standing up right now and saying, what is one of the greatest benefits you have as a believer? More than likely, prayer would be part of that. Because do you ever try to get your kids to do something when they're grown up? You know, they look at you as old fogies and behind the times. And uh, uh, we have this secret weapon called prayer. And uh, um, we've been instituting this our whole lives, praying for our kids. Uh, we've been praying for them when they were little, for their spouses. And now we're praying for the grandkids. I'm sure Margaret is as well as I am, that God would bring a spouse just right for them. And uh, I, I personally believe, without a shadow of doubt, that there is a lot of power in prayer. And uh, God aids us along the way as we trust him, because basically that's what you're saying as you uh, get on your knees. Paul says that, for I bow my knee unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, let me just make one uh, point that this is not the uh, must of prayer. Posture has nothing really to do with it. 
because uh, Paul says to pray without ceasing. So uh, when I used to drive a uh, truck, I prayed all along the way I'm driving. One, I was scared to death, not just of me, but whoever was in front of me. <laughs> but I'm praying, flying down the road with 80,000 pounds of whatever. And uh, I had my eyes open. So, you know, in this case, uh, this metaphor bound in knee is uh, really kind of a, uh, is a, is a, is a reality that we face because it's a, a subservient, prostrate uh, thing that we do. If uh, the Lord Jesus appeared for us now, the normal uh, stance would be on our faces. You know, that when Peter recognized Jesus in the boat, he was down on his face uh, once he saw who he was. So I understand what Paul is saying here, and I'm sure the readers as well, of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named. I wondered why he threw that in there, but as I was contemplating this and looking at uh, various writings, uh, what it reminded me of, and uh, I think is a correct application, that uh, you know we have a family that is not here. And uh, mom and dad, uh, and my grandmother, and my mother, and just go back in history of our loved ones that are waiting for us. Um, when the rapture happens, but those that are dead will rise first Amen. and will be caught up in the air and together will be joined together. So in some sense, Paul is saying that um, uh, of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named because of the Lord Jesus Christ, that credible, that event that will happen eventually will be what it says in scripture. And uh, it says of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by the might by the spirit in the inner man. So Paul's passion was there. He wanted the Gentiles to have everything that was afforded to him because of the blood of Christ. I have seven things I want to throw at you real quick. Just as a reminder, um, Paul's talking about uh, a great doctrinal passage that he has already shared uh, if you want to look at it from the perspective of how our Bibles are written now in chapter 1 and 2, from the fact that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, to the truth that he has made us fellow heirs along with Jews in the body of Christ, the church, that's chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, in between those verses are the facts that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that's uh, chapter 1, 4, he reached out to us, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, chapter 2, verse 1. He loved us despite our depravity and our wickedness, chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. He saved us by his grace and made us his children, in chapter 2, 5 through 10. He reached out to us who separated us from him by our sins, in chapter 2, 12 through 17. And he saved us and he adopted us into his family and made us a part of the body of Christ. That in, in reason enough to praise him for all eternity. All I can say is, hallelujah, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I think that's exactly what the Gentiles were thinking because they had already heard this letter. And as they were listening to this part of it, and Paul makes an effort to include them, that they uh, were, uh, I feel, and I could be all wrong, but they felt closer together because there's always going to be a difference between each other. Wherever you go. And uh, one of the things that unifies us as a church is uh, the Lord's table, because that blood unifies us. No one here is saved apart from the blood of Christ. And his battered body was for us, and he sacrificed himself for us. So that unifies us, because we all have differences of opinion. You know, you might think, uh, you should say yay, and I might say ye. You might think about amen, I might say amen. You know, and uh, there's all sorts of different things, uh, uh, arenas of contention, you know, about theologies and stuff that, you know, sometimes I get kind of sick of it. That's why Paul said, all I want to know is Christ. You know, let's get him saved first. Um, our friend Dylan, um, he corresponds with me. He's down in Texas A&M, and uh, he's come into uh, found a group of Christians that weren't really Christians. He came to the conclusion 
because uh, uh, you know they called themselves Christians, but as they repelled against the Word of God, then he was questioning me, what what do I do next? You know, so you run into those that are religious but not born again, and uh, uh, he's doing well, and he's considering um, ministry. So um, I said, well, pray about it and see where the God leads you. you can see where God leads you as you do your studies. And uh, I know his parents won't be too happy. But... All right, when we stop to consider everything that the Lord has done for us and saved us and changed our lives, it should motivate us to go to prayer. Um, in my men's Bible study, we're uh, looking at the model of prayer that Jesus gave the disciples, looking for uh, the the information for us so that we can uh, pray more effectively and all the other things that come along with that. Jesus uh, in the Gospels rem reminded the disciples, don't pray like them. The guy in the corner that waits for a crowd and says, oh God, how great you are. Pray like this. Go in your closet and hide and get under a blanket and pray in secret because that's, that's the correct way to pray. So we have this balance in the New Testament and the examples of the Lord Jesus Christ and of course of, of the other writers of the books that prayer is uh, a, a premium, uh, prayer is a necessary thing for us as believers. So I have uh, four things, five things I want to share with you real quick about prayer. First, it's a command. Amen. Go figure that out. It's not a choice. It's not an a la carte system. We're commanded to pray. Uh, Luke uh, 18 1 and he spoke a parable unto them this end that men ought always to pray and not faint first Thessalonians pray without ceasing prayer is a duty uh, first Timothy 2 I exhort therefore that first of all supplication prayers intercessions giving of thanks be made for all men kings for all that are in authority that they may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty, for this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Prayer is a gift. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Prayer, prayer is a privilege. Philippians chapter 4. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, and the peace of God which pass all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And the last thing, prayer is a promise. Jeremiah 33, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Isaiah 65, 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. John chapter 16, verse 23, and in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. We must make prayer a priority. And I, I'm saying that in my own mind as I, as I teach this right now and as I was sharing it Wednesday. That we have much to pray about and we have a God who invites us to come to him in prayer. We should humble ourselves before the Lord and ask him to help us. Make a prayer of passion a part of our existence as believers as we uh, negotiate this life. So number two, we have Paul's past posture in his prayer. And I, I mentioned about the posture, but it works out well that Paul considered these things, the power of them literally brought him to his knees. All of this uh, theology that he has shared with this church and other churches, uh, the reality of who Christ is and what Christ accomplished, and how God has balanced all this together for us. He has uh, shared with us the idea of, or the, um, I don't want to call it a metaphor because that's not what it was. He seriously bowed his knee. His, in his mind, he was on his knees. He was on his face. 
And uh, whether you're standing or sitting or driving, that, that uh, posture can still be a reality. And I found some interesting things. In Genesis chapter 18, Abraham stood when he prayed. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord, and Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteousness with the wicked? The righteous. David sat, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 16, and David the king came out and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is mine house that thou hast brought me hitherto? Uh, Jesus stretched out in Matthew chapter 26, and he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but uh, as thou wilt. Um, Sometimes it's very hard to pick just the right words to say when you're trying to uh, get a point across and uh, um, other men are more clever. I've listened to uh, uh, this Welsh preacher. Um, his last name is uh, Jones and he was, he's dead long from now, and, but they have his recordings and I was listening to a message and he was, his Welsh accent was more English than Welsh, so he must have been educated at Cambridge or something. But he was very, very careful how he chose his words. It was uh, usually done in periods of extreme humility and extreme distress. These examples I gave you, even Jesus laying on his face. Ezra knelt when he confessed the sins of the people in Ezra chapter 9. Daniel knelt when he learned that King Darius had signed the law on the prohibition of prayer. Daniel 6. Paul knelt with his elders from Ephesus before he departed in Acts chapter 20. If uh, you have the chance, as we go through Ephesians and some of the other epistles, if you would read the book of Acts, it would really help you uh, see the background of what's going on here. It's very entertaining and very enlightening. Um, Solomon knelt before the Lord at the dedication of the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Kneeling shows two truths that I want to share with you. First, it's a sign of submission. Think about this when the Queen of England comes in. What do you do? Got it, right? Even though we're from America, that would be the appropriate thing to do. Um, it's a sign of submission to one who is being far greater than we are. When we bow before the Lord, we're acknowledging his glory, his power, his authority over our lives. We bow in prayer before him because we understand that we are in the presence of one who is far higher in rank, dignity and glory and authority than we are. Bowing before the Lord in prayer is a sign of humility and submission before the Lord. I remember seeing a guy shake his fists and ask God to send lightning down to strike him. And I remember stepping back a little bit because he certainly deserved it, you know, but um, God is gracious. And he, he, was, he was an obnoxious person, but he was doing it for my benefit because, you know, I believe that God, he didn't. And I thought, well, you know, step back a little bit just in case, give God some room. But it didn't happen. It would have been a great story to tell you about, but I can't make it up, it would be a lie, but certainly I was on the side of the lightning. Um, <laughs> it's a sign of intense passion and emotion. In the passages I've shared in just the moments ago, we can see the emotion and passion that drove the individuals to pray. In other words, sometimes you are so overwhelmed by the circumstances and needs of life that nearly becomes a natural posture. I remember, and I hate to use my example because I'm very limited in my, um, well, this is what it was. When I was in the Air Force, I was stationed in South Dakota, and I got a call at night that my grandmother was in the hospital, and she didn't look good. So I spent the night on my knees. Matter of fact, I woke up in the morning on my knees, and uh, to be honest with you, I had a hard job getting up. My legs were so stiff. <laughs> I fell asleep and I didn't fall over. So I thought that's, I don't know how long I prayed, but I fell asleep when I woke up in the morning. I got a phone call that my grandmother had gotten better. Coincidence? Prayer is their sins. You know, this is just the way the Lord works. 
But, uh, you know, most of us have been there when there's no one else to turn to, you know, uh, God is always there. And for us as believers, it's a wonderful privilege to be able to be ushered into his presence and to trust him. Um, I had a little note down there. Re-emphasize God's not really worried about if you're sitting or standing or kneeling. Because sometimes people just hear that part and then they'll go out and say, well, Pastor Hall said we have to kneel all the time. I'm going to try to kneel while I'm driving. You know, that, that's not what I said. But uh, when Paul thought about the great truths that he had been revealed to him, he was brought to his knees, obviously. Number three, now, because of time, we'll jump into this, his purpose for the prayer. And obviously, we've already looked at this uh, more than once. But he says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ from the whole whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you. And uh, obviously, there's always a recipient to our prayers. There's always a focus. There's always a desire to see God do a work. Uh, I would qualify by saying that if you are going to pray to the Father, there has to be a submission that thy will be done is the theme. Not, Lord, twist this for my own pleasure, but, you know, thy will be done. Help me to receive your will. Uh, a lot of times we pray for folks to survive and they don't. A lot of times we pray for people to get a job and they don't. Um, a lot of times I pray for people to come to church and they won't. You know, and you throw up your hands. But at, at the, end of, the end of the rope is God saying, my will is sufficient for you and my will be done. You know, we can... Uh, request and plead and cry, but at the end of the day, we have to understand that God's will be done. In this last party, uh, his purpose, he shares two types of people. Uh, he bring in, begins the prayer to tell us that his purpose and prayers both to glorify God and to edify the church. And he takes a moment at the beginning of his prayer to remind us uh, just who we are in Christ. But uh, he, he gives us this clear biblical uh, picture of two lines of humanity. Uh, there are only two spiritual fatherhoods and every person is either in one or the other. Uh, one group is the children of Satan. And uh, uh, John chapter eight, verse 44, uh, you are your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you, do, you will do. Uh, he was a murderer from the beginning and bowed not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar, the father of a father of it, John 8. And the other group is uh, children of God. And behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Love it. Now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for he shall we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. That's 1 John chapter 3. There's an easy way to tell which family you belong to. And this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither uh, he that hath, uh, does not have love for his brother. 1 John 3, 10. Uh, one of the litmus tests we have as believers is the idea that... Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 calls us a uh, new creation, new creatures in Christ. And uh, depending on when you were saved, you should be able to look now and say, I can see a different change in me, a desire to please the Lord, uh, an urge or a thirst for the Word of God. We're all different, so I can't give you one, one picture. But, you know, Christ is your Savior. Obviously, you're here for a reason. There's a rejoicing in your heart because of what Christ has accomplished. And uh, most of us are at toward the end of our, our time here on earth, an anticipation of one day being in the presence of the Savior. I know a lot of people are scared of dying, and it's a terrible thing to say goodbye. We just said goodbye to Raj, and that was a terrible thing. But, you know, we have to not be selfish, but think about Raj now is with the Savior. Raj is no longer checking his... Uh, Sugar. He's eating whatever he wants. All the chocolate. Imagine that, Ronnie. Put that behind it and chips and all that other stuff. This is what this is what it's all about. 
There's drudgery in life, yet because of the, us as believers, we know we're a family. And we have family already there waiting for us. What did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. And when it's finished, I'm coming to get you. And that's, that's a promise. That's an individual promise to each one of us. Amen. So the worries of life are there. But what does Jesus say? If you have worry, cast it all upon me. And cast all your cares upon me. So we have a rich uh, benefit and uh, an obvious presence of God with the Holy Spirit inside us. And our family uh, is uh, waiting for us. Um, our family shares a common name. God is our father. We have all been adopted into that family. I shared with you the Roman adoption where the child that's adopted is treated just like a regular child. All the benefits, all the rights are there. Our family shares a common redemption. We are a one people, all washed in the precious blood of Christ. Whether we are here or there, the blood has redeemed us. Our family shares a common love. Whether we are in heaven on earth, we can rest in the truth that the Lord loves his children equally. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, he does not love them or know them any better than uh, than us because they are in heaven. He knows us all and he loves us equally. Uh, that's one of the greatest benefits, I think, as a believer. Have you ever been brought up in a family, you know, a family where there was a favorite child? Ch children are different than others, you know. God loves us equally. And uh, Paul said that he was the least of the apostles, yet he recognized God's love for him. And it's a great thing to think about. And, uh, you know, if you've lost loved ones before that are believers, you know they're there waiting for us. Uh, you know, when you get there and we're there together, you come up and talk to me and I'll tell you, I told you, it's just like we just got here. You know, they, they could have been there for 100 years and it's just like they just got there. I think that's in the uh, and anticipatory part of uh, getting to be with our family. the last two for the end of this. Our family is one in joy. There is joy in heaven over the grace of God. Luke chapter 15, verse 7 to 10. There is joy in the earth over the grace of God here as we uh, relish in the fact that God has wonderfully saved us. Our family has a common destiny. One day we'll all be together. So prayer is extremely important. Let, let me close with a story about a power of prayer in the life of a church um, that um, uh, was started by this guy, Chapman, was called as a young man to become the pastor of a large church in Philly. After his first sermon, an old man said to him, you're pretty young to be a pastor of this church, but you preach the gospel and I'm going to help you all I can. And Dr. Chapman thought, mm, is he a crank? What do you mean he's gonna help me? But the man continued, I'm praying, going to pray for you that you may have the Holy Spirit's power upon you. Now, don't misunderstand that phraseology because that's been uh, misused over the last couple of years, 100 years, I guess now. But uh, there's the, there is the fact of the gospel message going out with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's nothing we manufacture, but the pastor, the preacher, or the person sharing the uh, there has to be the connection. Uh, I believe personally as a pastor that um, I can't live the way I want to. And neither can you as well. There has to be a willing to submit to the, to the will of God. And to, uh, Paul says, little children, be clean. Uh, stay away from sin. So there's an active role that we take as believers now that we are trying to stay clean so God can use us. And this is, the, this is what's behind this. This man uh, started with 10 men as this young man was preaching, was in the basement praying that God would have his way with the congregation. And over the years, it grew to uh, 200 men downstairs and the church was exploding. He had 1,100 in the morning service. And uh, the story is told that uh, the young man uh, recognized the need for others to pray 
not for him to be a great pastor, but for the word of God to go out. And nothing has changed today. Even though we might sense that we're close to the end of our time as a church uh, because of the rapture, uh, uh, the same uh, urgency is there for us to get the gospel out, to share the good news. And uh, that's what I want to leave you with this morning, that Paul's passion for his uh, Gentile readers and the Jewish readers as well in Ephesians is that there's a unifying effect in the blood of Christ and that uh, much time must be spent in prayer as we try to uh, accomplish the will that God has for each one of us. I find a lot of comfort in praying, don't you? Amen. I love praying. And uh, I try to pray all the time. Yes. And uh, formally, I'm not so great at that. But I pray all the time in my mind. And of course, you know, my wife does as well. Uh, but... Uh, I read about guys that pray for hours, and I, I just can't do that. I can pray without ceasing and talk to the Father as I'm doing, but um, I, can't, I can't seem to get past 10 minutes without my mind starting to wander. But uh, God has a way of uh, connecting those prayers during the day and consolid I, um, consolidating them into some kind of package that he then, uh, I believe, uh, gives back to us in this idea of knowing that we have uh, been a, in his throne room in the presence of the king and of God himself. And so uh, let's pray together. Father, we're, we're uh, uh, at a loss of words sometimes when we try to articulate this, uh, this idea of praying. And uh, um, we, we find ourselves uh, in a bit of frustration sometimes not knowing exactly what to say. And uh, we want your will be done, but there's a sense within us that we'd like to see things done the way we like them. And so we have to come to grips with that. Um, we have to come to grips with the idea that thy will be done. We pray for the folks that are here today and that you would just uh, bless them and encourage them and uh, be with our friends that are going to be heading south in a few days, that you would get them home safely. And we pray for other churches in the area, like, like, like Faith Father, that you would bless their congregations as well. And we just give you the praise for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing one more hymn together. I believe it's um, What a Friend We Have. 317, let's stand together and sing this great hymn.
home safely. Thank you for meeting our needs. We pray for this week. Father, give us opportunities to share the love of Christ with others. And we just give you the praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.